We're going to begin a series about uh, non-infectious causes um, of reduced reproductive performance in cattle. There are quite a few topics here that we'll cover and I've split this roughly up into equivalent of about four lectures. Uh, in the first lecture we'll talk about structural causes of infertility um, in particular developmental defects, acquired defects, vex and free martinism. Uh, next we'll move on to cystic ovarian disease um, then we'll spend a bit of time speaking about anestrus and a variety of other factors that cause um, a reduced reproductive performance in cattle. So this particular session we're just going to look at the congenital and acquired structures that cause infertility in cattle and you should be able to uh, recognize these when you see them and diagnose them and understand um, how they might have developed. So just briefly we're talking about non-infectious causes of infertility as apart from bacterial causes of infertility and we're going to fo uh, focus on structural and functional causes. Some of the structural causes of infertility can be con congenitally acquired uh, and these in include things such as segmental aplasias, uh, absence of parts or agenesis, hyperplasia um, or the developmental condition known as free martinism. Other defects can be acquired and these can be a variety of things such as adhesions, lacerations, um, cervical incompetence, urine pooling, conformational defects, abscesses uh, and neoplasia. A variety, so a variety of things can occur um, throughout life that can cause defects. Some of the developmental defects that affect the reproductive tract of cows, I'll just mention them briefly and then we'll illustrate some with some pictures. Um, segmental aplasias, hydrocell pinks where you've got um, dilation of the aviduct with fluid and this can arise from uh, absence of part of the aviduct which may cause fluid to pool in the region proximal to the to the bit that's missing or that it's um, constricted. Um, you can get various congenital cysts or remnants of the paramecenephric ducts and these can cause cystic like structures. Uh, in the uterus you can get hyperplasia of the uterus, bits missing such as segmental aplasias, um, duplication of parts. Um, in the cervix you can end up with uh, duplication of the cervix. The vagina, things we uh, most commonly see are such things such as persistent hymen or Gartner's ducts and I'll just try to illustrate these briefly with some pictures. First of all let's look at Gartner's ducts which you may see in the floor of the vagina and these are remnants of the Wolfian or the mesonephric ducts um, which are part of the male reproductive system um, in the embryo. The Wolfian ducts in a male become the vas deferens but in the female they degenerate and are no longer seen. But in some cases you'll get remnants of those ducts and you'll see them as tubular like structures in the floor of the vagina. So potentially you'll have one on each side. Um, they don't normally interfere with fertility but if you happen to see them that's what they are. They're remnants of the male system of remnants of the Wolfian duct system. Um, this is just an example of uh, duplication of parts and this is a duplication of the vulva. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this but um, you may see it. Um, from time to time. You will see these though, they're, they're quite common uh, congenital vulval wattles. Uh, they're finger-like projections that occur uh, on the exterior or surface of the vulva um, or on near the mucocutaneous junction and they're not, they don't really affect fertility at all. Um, sometimes property owners uh, may think that the heifer will be infertile, it has one, but uh, generally speaking they don't affect fertility uh, in any way. Persistent hymens, uh, these occur um, where you've got the junction between the vestibule and the vagina and normally that breaks down but if it persists you can get fluid accumulating cranial to the persistent hymen. And this, mu this mucus um, accumulation um, can be quite thick and mucoid in, in nature. Um, what differentiates these from uh, pyometras, which is pus in the uterus? In the case of pyometra, the animals are often don't show signs of heat. Um, they're often anestrous. But in the case of persistent hymen, the animals will cycle. Um, treatment obviously means um, just by breaking down the hymen and draining the fluid uh, if, it's happened, if it happens to be built up. 
this is duplication of the cervix uh, in this case here we have a cervix uh, attached to each uterine horn in this case here we have two cervical openings but each opening leads to a single cervical canal and again um, this is uh, not very common um, and um, it's just an abnormality of, um, of, of development that has occurred. Uh, uterus unicornis, um, this involves segmental aplasia of the paramecenephric duct. So you're getting part of the paramecenephric duct um, not fully developing and um, regressing. And this condition um, can be in inherited. Um, there was a condition called white heifer disease in uh, historically was it found in a, in a high prevalence in white shorthorn cattle but it's also found in other cows as well. Um, the animals can get pregnant, they can cycle and they can deliver a fetus if, if they get pregnant in the other unaffected horn. But you may come across these when you're pregnancy testing and we recommend that the animals be culled because there is some genetic association with this abnormality. Parovarian cysts, these are cyst-like structures that you'll find associated with the broad ligament or close in close to the uterine horn or the uterine, uh, sorry, close to the ovaries or the uterine horns and these are remnants of the mesonephric duct system um, or the what's called Wolfian duct. Sometimes you can confuse these with ovaries but um, if you carefully um, find two separate ovaries and you find these cysts are separate to the ovaries um, then you may uh, be able to diagnose them as just a remnant and they don't, they don't usually affect fertility. This is just another one uh, in a close association with the ovary so you would feel the ovary and then feel a separate cyst like structure and they don't usually affect fertility at all. Some of the acquired defects that we'll, we can look, I'll show you some pictures of um, these can be conformational changes, adhesions, neoplastic conditions, etc. Um, this is just a natural phenomenon. Um, this is bleeding associated with metestrus in the cow. So you may be looking at a group of cows and you'll see some blood discharging from the vulva um, or attached to the tail or on the ground in bedding material next to the animal. The animal will be acting normally, so clinically normal. Um, usually there's a history that the animal's been in heat in the last few days and it's just simply associated with um, transition to menestrus and a declining estrogen you get a little bit of diapodesis of red blood cells into the vagina and in some animals you'll see that uh, as a bit of blood um, coloured fluid emerging from the vulva attached to the tail on the ground. Um, again nothing wrong with these cows but you do need to differentiate it obviously from an abortion or a dystocia or other causes of hemorrhage but most of these well, these cows will be um, cycling normally and um, usually there'll be uh, history that they've been in heat in the last couple of days. This is just a conformational problem in uh, cow in poor body condition where you get a sunken anus and a cranial displacement of the vulva. It's the sort of thing we see in horses a lot but occasionally you'll see it in cows with poor body condition. Um, this cow probably had a traumatic injury a previous birth so you've got incompetence of the vulval seal in this animal. Uh, perineal laceration again uh, third degree perineal laceration associated with a previous calving injury. Uh, you see those occasionally not very common in the cow. Sometimes you'll see acute swelling of the vulva and this can be associated with um, allergic reactions so sometimes you'll inject a particular drug cow might start shaking its ears and looking a little bit distressed and you'll see rapid swelling of the vulva. Other times it can be associated with photosensitization or simply just an insect bite. So you will see this occasionally and um, particularly if you're looking for photosensitization uh, in a black animal um, this is a good area to look for signs of swelling. Uh, neoplasia, um, particularly in non-pigmented uh, vulval tissue in cows, um, is quite common in our environment. So squamous cell carcinomas are very common in older cows um, as exposed to uh, excessive amounts of sunlight. We'll talk about this in later um, lectures but uh, prolapse of the cervix also occurs from time to time. We'll talk about that more later. 
uh, tumors involving the vagina or the uterus uh, can occur they're not very common but they do occur this one happens to be a lymphosarcoma and it's involving part of the um, cranial vagina this is a leiomyoma um, associated with the uterus and you can see this is a postpartum cow so the cow has carb recently so if it's exterior to the uterus um, it may not interfere with fertility but obviously you'll, you may pick this up on rectal palpation as a discrete uh, lump and you may need to differentiate it from an abscess so occasionally these, these will cause some problems in, in animals and be a source of culling uh, lymphosarcoma involving the uterus, just a disseminated um, lymphosarcoma throughout the uterus. Uh, Hydrosalpinx, uh, accumulation of fluid, an abnormal accumulation of fluid within the oviduct, usually associated with some sort of blockage somewhere along the oviduct. And this might be due to an adhesion or con congenital agenesis or aplasia uh, of a particular region of the oviduct. Um, this one here, it's just congenitally part of the oviduct is missing here and then you're getting fluid build up uh, near that region. Uh, you see um, distension of the oviduct uh, with the fluid as a result of blockage of that oviduct probably due to scar tissue and adhesions in this case. So sometimes you'll feel that on rectal palpation. Again some more um, adhesions um, this time the periovarian tissue uh, is involved in an adhesion um, and the ovarian bursa is also adhered to the ovary as well and again if this prevents um, the oocyte from entering the oviduct then that may, can be a source of infertility particularly if it's bilateral again this is another example of an adhesion tight adhesion uh, around the ovary which may interfere with fertility this is something we see occasionally in Brahmin cows, um, what we call pancake ovaries. They're large, flat ovaries. Um, they're not considered abnormal. The animal will eventually cycle, but it can be associated with anestrus, that is, cows failing to cycle. And you will pick it up occasionally. Usually, if you leave the animals alone, they put on a bit of condition, etc. They'll not, they'll usually um, commence cycling. Um, but it's just the appearance of large, flat ovaries. Um, in the occasional animal. Granulosa and th uh, thecal cell tumours uh, occasionally are seen in animals, in uh, cattle, and um, you'll pick these up as either solid masses um, or cystic, multi-cystic multi um, structures. So just a quick review of this session, if you saw this type of structure um, or if you're looking at the anterior vagina of a cow what, what are these tubular-like structures? What is their origin? So these are called Gartner's ducts and they're remnants of the male uh, mesonephric ducts um, and um, usually they don't cause any problems uh, with fertility. What is this structure here? Uh, located on the intercorneal ligament. What's its origin? Again, this is a remnant of the male system, the Wolfian duct or the mesonephric duct system, and it's just a cyst like structure. And occasionally you'll palpate them um, in the broad ligament, intercorneal ligament, um, close to the ovary, and they don't usually cause any problems with fertility. So you've got a unilaterally enlarged ovary um, on this animal. You've got a corpus luteum on the left ovary. What what are possible? Uh, what are some of the causes of a unilaterally enlarged ovary? 35 days post calving in a cow with a corpus luteum on the left ovary, which you can just see here. Well, again. Um, granulosa and thecal cell tumour that would be a little bit unusual 35 days post calving but could be on the list an abscess uh, would also be on the list um, have we got a cystic remnant of the Wolfian duct um, associated with that doesn't particularly look like one but certainly could be on the list of possibilities um, any adhesions um, doesn't particularly look like an adhesion in this case 
Is it a condition known as cystic ovarian disease? Um, not particularly um, likely with the presence of a corpus luteum here 35 days post calving but certainly would be on your differentials list of differentials. And that ends that section and in the next session we'll talk about free martinism. <laughs>